negative thinking is a manifestation of what I talked about before, fear, doubt, confusion, indecision, and worry, right? And, um, you know, Bob Proctor's got a saying about worry. He said, you know, worry doesn't rob tomorrow of its sorrow. It robs today of its joy, right? So worrying about something that happens tomorrow, (laughs) good. it's not going to stop it from happening, but it's going to make today miserable. Heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them, from the larger-than-life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen to the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. The doctor saving lives at your local hospital. The war veteran down the street who risked his lives for our freedom. The police officers and firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur. The creator. The producer. The ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. And I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks of the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews and I am live on the line today with C. Gordon Moose. Are you there? I am. Awesome. Glad to have you here, Gordon. For uh, our guests that don't know who you are, I'm going to run through just a brief introduction for for them. You are a trainer um, and you train people how to find folk. You are the author of a couple of courses on that topic with uh, with finding focus, and then also a couple uh, a course on uh, the principles behind think and grow rich. So you do a lot of training in that space. And you know, before we even got on the interview, you were talking about moving that whole like we're doing some training with think and grow rich down in Haiti. So that's uh, got some good things that are going on there. My my first question for you, Gordon, is what is it that you're known for now? Why do people come to you? Why do they hire you? What is the uh, what what the basics of your business basically? Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I've done a couple of different things, but, uh, you know, with regard to this, the, the find your focus, um, I've been a student of, of Bob Proctor. Many, many people know who Bob Proctor is. I worked with him for yep. years. Um, he was very, he was the, the number one guy in the movie, the secret, and he's a big thinking grow rich Napoleon Hill, um, uh, fan. He actually knew Napoleon Hill. And I think he's one of the last, I think there's about two or three people left that have a direct connection to, Napoleon Hill and Bob's one of them, you know, and, and people, uh, I trained and, and I was a protege of Bob's and Bob was a protege of, of Napoleon Hill. So I have an a, a area of expertise in the think and grow rich philosophy. I've been studying it and applying it to my life for several decades. And so people recognize that and they come to me when they want training around think and grow rich. And then my program has evolved, take it one step further, uh, uh, revolves around focus and how we find, maintain and sustain our focus for long-term success. Awesome. And so is that your, your primary revenue generator right now is the courses and the training or do you have other, uh, other businesses that you run? Well, I, I'm moving towards doing this full time, but I'm also a real estate consultant. I've got, uh, uh, you know, some expertise in commercial real estate. So I work for a company that does uh, insurance work. They negotiate insurance claims and I work with them uh, as well. But the, the find your focus stuff and the think and grow rich stuff is really my passion. Awesome. That sounds like a, um, like it's a, a fun space to be in. Yeah. So my, uh, my first like real question is about your origin story, right? Every hero has their origin story. It's where you started to realize that you were different, that maybe you had superpowers and maybe you could use them to help other people where you started to really develop or discover the value you can bring to this world. Sort of how did you get started in the entrepreneur journey? Yeah. Well, <laughs> You know, like a lot of people, it was out of necessity, out of, out of, um, uh, you know, just you, you wanted something, right? And so yeah. you know, I, I played hockey all my life. And, you know, my, my dad was a professor. He never earned a lot of money and he was very frugal. So I remember when I was about 12 or 13 years old, um, he took me down to the rink uh, and we were going to, for an equipment swap. Because when you're that age, you, you know, you, you outgrow your equipment in half a season. So yeah. they would always swap equipment. So you could get used equipment. And, which was fine for the most part, but I wanted my own skates. I didn't want somebody else's skates. So my dad 
said, well, the skates cost X. And I think back then X was about 50 bucks and a new pair is cost for about a hundred bucks. So he said, I'll give you the 50 bucks for, for the used pair, but I'm not springing a hundred bucks for a new pair. So I went home and, you know, I was all upset and I was probably 12 or 13 years old. Yeah. And my mom, you know, my mom, who was a real entrepreneur in the family, you know, my, my dad was the intellect. Um, you know, she said, well, cut a deal with your dad and figure out a way to get the other 50 bucks and have him donate 50 bucks and have a match your 50 bucks and go buy a new pair of skates. So the light bulb went off and she said, I said, how am I going to do that? She goes, go, you know, get, go get a paper route or shovel, you know, shovel drives or cut grass or do whatever, walk dogs. Right. So the light bulb went off. And again, to make a long story short, I cut a deal with my dad and I wouldn't be surprised if my mom set him up for this because that's how smart she was. <laughs> I went and I said, Dad, listen, if I bring a dollar, will you match a dollar? And he said, you, you know, he said, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll match a dollar. Well, that's the way it worked until I was about 17 when I was actually making, you know, a couple hundred bucks a week. I'd come home with my paycheck and I said, Dad, you know, here's my paycheck. And he'd write me a check for whatever my paycheck was because nice. that was the deal I struck with him. You know what I mean? So while everybody else was making minimum wage, I was making twice minimum wage because my dad was. And then when I was 17 years old, he said, enough of this. You know, it was a big deal <laughs> when, when you were a kid making. 50 bucks a month. He said, but you know, now you're making a hundred or 200 bucks a week, forget it. So, um, but that's where I caught the bug. You know, I, I really, the light bulb went off and said, you know, if I want something, um, what's stopping me from going out and getting it, except my own, my mindset, except my own limitations. So it really, I really caught the bug when I was a little kid. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of, uh, uh, my story, I was uh, 13 or so when I decided I needed to get into business for the first time. And I, I convinced my dad to give me a loan for 50 bucks so I could buy candy. Um, and I was buying all the big fancy candies at the, the big box store um, and bringing them to school. And, uh, you know, like the proverbial guy on uh, New York with a trench coat showing them my wares. It was a backpack full of all the big candies they couldn't get at school. Right, right, um, right. I sold about fifteen hundred dollars of uh, of candy before I got shut down by the uh, the powers that be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did your dad charge you interest? My dad used to charge us interest. So, so I he did not charge me interest, but I did have to pay him back. Um, so you know, of course, so I got I I got the fifty bucks, and like it, it really blew me away because like I I I got fifty bucks, and I bought fifty dollars worth of candy, and I sold it, and I had a hundred dollars. Yeah, and. So I had to pay back my dad back 50 and then I had to go buy more inventory. So I had $0 at the end and I was like all blown away. I was like, I made a hundred dollars and I have nothing to show right, for it. Right, right. Um, and I had to have, I had to have uh, someone explain to me what like profits and margin and all that stuff were. Yeah. So, you know, it's a good lesson for a 13 year old. Oh, you know, I think it's a lesson that enough kids aren't taught these days. I mean, yeah. it, really, it really teaches you about, about all that stuff, which is obviously valuable as you're, when you become an adult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's a, it's really great to learn that as a kid too, and learn that you can, you are the master of your destiny, so to speak. Um, absolutely. and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to get started young with that though. I am really quite jealous that you managed to convince your dad to match your, uh, match your earnings. You know, it, it was my mom's <laughs> idea, you know, and I just, the literally the light bulb went off and I said, do you think he would do that? And she kind of shrugged her shoulders and said, well, you should ask him. And I'm, I'm pretty sure she prepped him, you know, because yeah. he agreed to it and it was great until I started actually making some money. And then he would, I would bring my, I couldn't wait to bring my paycheck home, show it to my dad and I'd stand right over him. You know, and make it right out the check. And, you know, and it got to a point, I was about 16 and a half or 17 years old. And he said, enough of this. This is it. I'm not, you're no more. And I think I'm not matching you anymore. Yeah. That was a good deal while it was going. Oh, it was a great deal. You know what I mean? And, you know, of course he told me, don't tell your brothers and sisters this, you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but I was motivated. I mean, I, you know, I had money. I mean, I was a kid. I had money. I bought my own car when I was 16 cash. You know what I mean? And it, it, yeah. it, it really opened my eyes and say, I, I, I am, the only limits I have with regard to this are the limits that I, I put on myself, you know? And so I went out. Awesome. And, yeah. So when did you get into the, uh, the, the training that you do now for find your focus? Yeah. So, you know, the first time, the first time I was exposed to the book, I was in high school and, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Cleveland. I was a pretty good hockey player and, you know, as a, our coach gave it to us and, you know, of course I looked at it and threw it aside. I didn't read it. I wish I would have because my career would have been a lot better. Uh, but it was years later that I was exposed to it where I, I had an opportunity to go to a, an event where Zig Ziglar was there. God rest his soul. He's passed away. Bob Proctor was there. 
And I was a young man. Suzanne Summer was there, which you may not know who Suzanne Summer is. I, I'm I've heard of her. Yeah, she was, well, she was a pretty attractive actress. So I wanted to go and meet her. Yeah. So, well, it ended up that <laughs> the person that resonated the most with me was Bob Proctor. And, you know, he was speaking. I never heard of him before. Never, never knew who he was or anything. And he was just, what he was saying was resonating with me. It was all about the principles of success, you know, and, and so that's what was my first exposure. And then years later, I had an opportunity to do a year long program with him. It was a inaugural program that he did uh, with two other people. Um, and it was called the head of the table. It was a very expensive, it was a six figure uh, cost. I mean, but we, we flew all over the country. We stayed at, uh, you know, really uh, five star resorts. And, and I was with 22 other people from all over the world that could afford to write a check that big. And, and it was the best money I ever spent. And that's, that's really where I got immersed in it. And I started, I started to study it. And I studied it more and studied it more and started implementing it into my life. And then I realized there were some gaps for me with the, you know, for anybody that's read the book, it, you know, it, it was written a long time ago, but it's still relevant. However, there are some gaps. So I, I went on a journey to really search and find out where those gaps were. And I, you know, at one point I read 188 books in one year looking for that. And everything from from self-help books to autobiographies to ancient texts that go back to the Vedas and, and Marcus Aurelius wow. and, you know, and, and the art of war and all kinds of stuff. And, um, and I did this and I documented it all. And I shared this with people and say, wow, that's really awesome. They said, could you train me? Could you teach me, you know, and train me on this stuff? I said, yeah. So I started putting classes together and I, you know, people were willing to pay and it evolved kind of, you know, by default. Um, and then, you know, within the last year or 18 months, I've really started to, um, um, you know, work it by design. And, you know, yeah. the, the thing I love about it is there's nothing more gratifying to see somebody get an idea for themselves for the first time. And it really alters the way they think about their future or their family or their health or wellness. And that's the most gratifying thing about what I do. I, I just, I really, and I think we all have this in us. We, don't, we all love to help people. You know, we, we love to see people grow. And, and to do something that's significant that really makes a difference for them. And, you know, people are willing to pay me. So it's, it's one of the ways I, I feed my family. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's a, it's a cool sort of like origin story too. And, you know, reading 180 books, not a lot of people have read that many books in their whole life, um, let alone in a year. Yeah. Well, I took a year off and I did it. I, I was reading, you know, four books at a time and, you know, not to go off on a tangent, but the way I would do it was I'd read one chapter chapter, out of each book that was sitting there. So before you know it, I was actually reading four books at the same time. And, you know, I, it was 188 books. And I, you know, people say, well, why'd you stop there? And I said, I, what happened was, no matter what, what book I was reading, I was getting the same message. And it was the same recurring yeah. message. And it was the message that I, that it was the original message, you know, from Think and Grow Rich. Because if you really think about it, you know, principles of success are as old as human beings are. You know, we've been studying mm -hmm. this stuff, and putting them into practice in one form or another. So I really got to a point where my vessel was full and it was time for me to start to share it. And that's, that's why I just, you know, n n you know, I continue to read, I read about a book a, a week, but it's not at the same pace of, you know, three or four books a week. Uh, but I was just very hungry for, for information. I was just on a quest and, and um, you know, it, it uh, uh, that, that's just how it ended up. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I was just listening to, uh, audiobook of uh, Jordan Peterson's his uh, 12 rules for life or whatever and he mentioned like that same same idea that you just mentioned um, that I was reading this morning that our our pathways for success have sort of been built in for a millennia yeah. right and there's there's not much new we already sort of know what what it is that leads to success and it's right. just a matter of like doing it yeah, getting into action. That's exactly right. I mean, it's, you know, the difference between knowing and doing, there's a big gap there. And, and uh, you know, Bob Proctor calls it the knowing and doing gap. I mean, you know, listen, we all know how to lose weight. You know, you eat less, and you exercise more. But why are we, why are so many people overweight? Well, they just don't get into action. You know, they don't, they yeah. don't alter their mindset. And so the knowing of it isn't always what the key is. It's the knowledge and the application of that knowledge and having a plan so that you can actually implement and get into action. That's what makes a difference. And that's the difference between people that are really highly successful and people that are less successful. Yeah, it's just the, the difference of how much they're willing to actually do things different, get out of their comfort zone and, uh, and you know, change. Exactly. Yep, I totally agree with you. <laughs> so my next question for you is about your superpowers. 
right? Superpowers is, is, uh, is, is what you do or build or offer to this world that really helps solve problems for people. And the way I've been framing this recently for guests on the show is, you know, in your subset of skills, you probably have one skill that you've noticed has energized the rest of them that sort of like powers all of your other skills. Do you, or have you thought about what that is for you? What is the sort of the underlying skill set that allows you to do all the things that you do? Yeah. Can we have more than one if we have multiple? You can, you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, self-esteem and self-image is very important. And, you know, for whatever reason I've always said, I think it's because of my parents. My parents were very supportive and, and very loving and, and all of us kids have a pretty good self-image. So I think that has a lot to do with it. But what people have told me, and so I have to believe what people tell me because I, I hear it over and over again, is that they say I'm a really good listener and they say that I, I have the ability of taking relatively complex uh, uh, concepts and putting it into everyday uh, practical ways that people can very easily understand. And a lot of these principles can be complex. However, they're very simple at their root. And, and so people, people have told me I'm, I'm a very good listener and that I also can explain complex things in a very simple way. Yeah, I, uh, I call that uh, I call that that ability, you know, the ability to put the cookies on the lower shelf. <laughs> I like that. I've never so, heard that before. That's always been my phrase for it is you can take the cookies from up here and you can put them down here where, uh, where everyone else can reach them. <laughs> I like that. I've never heard that before. Do you mind if I use that? Yeah, absolutely. All you right. can you can All certainly right. steal that is because uh, right. I've had I've had people tell me the same thing and say you're really good at uh, at explaining complicated things because I do a lot of stuff in the tech space and so I can speak the, uh, the tech language really well. Yeah. Um, look, there's our new cat that keeps inter, inter, uh, <laughs> um, interjecting on our, uh, our, our podcast stuff. Who wants um, to participate. Wants to participate. But yeah, it's, it's the, that ability to, um, to you know, take something complex and make it simple enough for someone else to understand, Absolutely. Um, which is a, a really useful and powerful skill. Um, and to your point, one of the things that I think powers that is empathy right? The ability to see the world the way someone else does. And listening is a really key indicator of someone who has a high empathy skill set as well. Yeah. Um, so I think they all sort of tie together in that, in that vein. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was just rewriting, you know, I don't know if you've ever read the book, but it's, it's a phenomenal book. It's really a blueprint for success. And one of the chapters is organized planning. Um, that's the sixth principle out of the 13. And in that, in that chapter, it talks about the seven leadership tenants, what all great leaders do. And I just literally rewrote it. You can't see it. It's on my desk. So I rewrote it because every now and then I'll, I'll take it and rewrite it just so it's, it's present to me again. And the last mm -hmm. one, the last one is, is of the 11. Number 11 is taking 100% responsibility for your, your feelings, uh, your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. The number 10 one is exactly what you just said, empathy, and consideration for other people. And that is a leadership tenant. You, you, know, you can't be yeah. having that. Yeah, and it's the, the, empathy, the empathy one is really, um, it seems ethereal because like to have empathy, you have to actually care about the other person. Right. right? It's not something that you can fake. Uh, um, and a lot of people are like, well, you know, how do you, how do you become a good listener? How do you care about the other person? And like the, the trick to that is you have to actually care. Yeah. <laughs> right. You have to care about them, care about their being, care about their future and that kind of stuff. I, I totally agree with you. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that we're all universally connected. I mean, you know, there's, we're all connected. So when you start to look at each other, you know, we have a tendency to look and see what the differences are between each other. But the reality is we have far more similarities than we do differences. And, and when you get connected to that and you, you're connected with the person you're talking to, you can have empathy for them because you can, you can see the world from their perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, you know, to uh, pull up to kill a mockingbird, you can put your, put their shoes on and walk a mile in their shoes. <laughs> I didn't really, uh, yep. really understand what, uh, what they're going through. Um, and to your point with leadership, it's one of those things that's really required. You can't lead a team or lead your family or lead anything unless you really understand what the other people care about and what they want, where they want to go. Absolutely. Awesome. So the other side, the flip side of that superpower coin is the fatal flaw, right? So just like Superman has his kryptonite, um, <laughs> in your world, in your business, yeah. think of the kryptonite as something that's held you back in your business, something you've yeah. had to overcome. Sure. And I think more importantly than what it is, 
how have you dealt with that? So people who are listening and suffer from the same thing might learn from your experience there. Sure, absolutely. Well, I'll take it right out of the book. I mean, the last chapter of the book is called Outwitting the Six Ghosts. It talks about the six, uh, the six human fears that I don't care who you are, or where you're born or when you were born. If you're human, these are part of your design. And I, you know, I can go through those real quickly because one sure. of them is, answers the question. So it's the fear of, the, uh, the fear of poverty or the fear of success, right? Those are polar opposites. Yeah. The, fear of, uh, the fear of judgment or criticism, that's number two. The fear of loss of affinity or friendship or love, yeah. right? That's number three. The fourth one is the fear of uh, ill health or illness. The fifth yeah. one is the fear of uh, old age. And the last one you could probably guess is the fear of death, right? Fear well, death, yeah. Of the thousands of people that I put through my program, I've had people come up with different fears, the fear of heights. Well, it's not a fear of heights, it's the fear of death. Fear of spiders. It's not, you're not afraid of a little spider. You're afraid of getting bitten and getting sick, right? Or you know, mm-hmm. all the fears basically fit into your know, fear of public speaking. People aren't afraid of public speaking. They're afraid of being judged or they're afraid of being criticized. Yeah. Right? So, so for me, it's really, it boils down to anywhere where I've been stopped in my life, it boils down to fear, doubt, confusion, indecision, or worry. One of those five things are in, in play. So, you know, my kryptonite is my fear of judgment or fear of criticism, right? And, you know, part of that has held me back. And it's, it's about credibility, you know, in, mm-hmm. you know, when you're talking about something and you claim to be an expert on something, you better have, you better back it up. You know, what did Joe DiMaggio say? He said, you know, bragging isn't bragging if you can back it up. Right. So for me, yeah. for years, one of the things that stopped me from really taking the lid off this was the fact that I, I said, well, who am I, you know, who am I to, to, yeah. to talk about success? You know, when I, when I, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm not making seven figures or whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I really, it really came into, and, and, and this applies uh, pretty much to anybody, you know, anybody that's listening, if you, you know, if you're stopped in any area of your life, your relationships, your, your profession, your education, your health, your wellness, your spirit, whatever it is, money, your career, fear, doubt, and confusion, indecision, and worry are at play. And this much I know, when you can get to the root of that and you can manage that because you're never going to get rid of it, right? Fear of mm-hmm. judgment, fear of criticism is very deeply rooted in our psyche, all of us. And there's a reason we don't have time now to talk about it, but there's a reason why that is. And when you become aware of that, as I mentioned before, then you can start to control it. And when you control it, you direct it. And when you direct it, you can bring significance and meaning back into what you're doing. And so that for years stopped me, fear of judgment, fear of criticism. And I'll tell you a real quick, funny story. There's a guy that I, that I used to play hockey with. that's a couple of years older than me. I looked up to him. He runs the largest uh, private jet company in North America. You know, he owns 32 jets. Oh, that's and, cool. Oh yeah. People, I mean, you know, he's, people pay him a lot of money, you know, to be on, he's got offices in four different kinds, very successful guy. Right. And, and I looked up to him. And so, you know, I was always fearful of what he would say if I told him, or if he found out that I was, you know, training people on being success and focus and everything else. And sure enough, he found something I post on Instagram. He called me up and he said, Hey, what's up with this focus thing? You know, find your focus, you know, you're the focus guy, you know, and I thought he was going to give me a, a, a bunch of, you know, a hard time. You know what he said to me? He said, you know what, Carl? He goes, that's awesome. He says, I could see you doing that. You've always been a, you know, you've been a leader on every hockey team you've ever played on. You got a great attitude. You know, you, 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 you've had a lot of success in your life. Right. And that, that, in that moment, I realized all that fear that had stopped me before of judgment and criticism was all in my mind. It was all yeah. in my own mind. And it stopped me from years from sharing my gift and what I'm passionate about. And for anybody that's listening, whatever it is for you, it, fear is a state of mind and you're afraid of something that hasn't happened yet. I was afraid this guy was going to criticize me and he did just the opposite. He said, you're awesome at this. You know, you're, you should do this. He said, that's awesome. So do you, under, can you, do you understand the story? I mean, you know, it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. it was in my own mind. It, it reminds me of, uh, of something my wife tells me all the time um, as a joke. She, uh, uh, she has a, it cracks me up too. Cause she always says, well, Worrying is her most effective strategy in, the, in, in life because uh, um, everything she worries about doesn't happen. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and, 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 and for me, you know, I really, I was being selfish, you know, because I was being afraid of being criticized. You know what? I mean, come on. You know, if you really think about all the good work that you can do and when you get outside yourself, like I was talking about before, when you realize that what you're up to is really bigger than you, the fear mm-hmm. goes right out the window. It doesn't mean it's not there. 
right? I mean, even to like, I've never met you before. So a little bit of that creeps up. Like, you know, is this guy going to judge me? Is he going to criticize me? But now I can manage it where before it ruled my life. Now I, I recognize it because I'm mm-hmm. aware of it and I can control and direct it. It has a totally different dynamic. It's it's amazing to me too how how that that one shift of of awareness yeah um, totally changes the game for things that are are holding you back right um, and just to to switch gears on it a little bit um, my uh, I've been working with a, a, a concierge doctor on health things um, and one of the things that uh, he was talking about with me and he talks about with all of his clients is like like for for me I'm I'm healthy like I'm I'm not in a bad place. Um, and he's like, if you go through like normal healthy or, you know, health testing, you like, you would check all the boxes, green light, you'd be good. He's like, but you have trends that are downward. Right. And if we don't reverse those trends, when you're 60, you'll be dead. Right. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff. And he's like the, the difference between you now and you know, when you're 60 and you now when you're 60 is, is awareness, right. If you change the awareness on, on what you're doing and how you're doing it, um, you can change that trend line. Right. Nice. Um, and, and so when you have awareness of a problem in your life, um, you can manage it and you can change way it, the way it's trending in your life in the future. 100%. And for, you know, for everybody, you know, fear, when most people are completely and totally unaware of what they're afraid of. You know, I love it. I talk to these guys. I, you know, I, I played hockey with guys that played the NHL and their names on the Stanley Cup and go on, you know, so on and so forth. Big, tough guys. And uh, you know, what are you afraid of? Right? Well, I'm not afraid of anything. I was like, really? You're not afraid of anything. You're not afraid of your kids? getting sick. You're not afraid of your parents dying. You're not afraid of, you know, uh, you know, your business collapsing, you know, and they probably, Whoa, yeah, that's different. I'm like, no, it's not. I was like, be honest with yourself. You're not even aware of the, of these things until someone brings it to your attention. And so uh, totally agree with you, whether it's your health or your relationships or your, your finances, mm-hmm. you know, awareness is the, is the starting point. You know, if you're not aware of something, you're never going to control it. You'll never direct it. Yeah. Yeah. And then you may not even be, you know, aware that it's stopping you that that's yeah. the thing that's that's stopping you from taking forward motion yeah and i tell people i said you know what are you aware of your awareness you know like seriously like what is your awareness about your awareness i mean most people walk around completely totally un- unaware of of a lot of things that are going around them so you know it's, you know it's one of those you know it's like are you aware of your awareness most people aren't they have no clue about even what they're thinking about yeah yeah and and it will uh um it, it will like we we talk in marketing um, all the time when you're when you're building messages that you have you have levels of awareness and the four levels of awareness are what why how and now um, that's how we uh, how I, how I, I do them but it's people who the what is like you know if you go to the doctor and the doctor says hey you're fat sick and nearly dead your first response is what right <laughs> right it's like you you don't know what the problem is you're not even aware that there was a problem so they're they're not problem aware they're not solution aware they're not in any of those spaces they're just wandering around and the vast majority of people with whatever problems they are facing are in that space right so you have to build marketing messages for people who are that are going to educate them about what the problem is Next level is the why, right? So if your doctor tells you you're fat, sick, and nearly dead, and after you say what, and he's, you know, your next question is, well, why, right? Why do I have that problem, right? And that's when you start looking at root causes, and that's the next level of awareness. And then you have the how. It's like, well, how do I fix it, right? That's where you're starting to research and do things, and you have different marketing messages for those people. And then you have the now, which is, okay, I need to do something about this, right? I need to fix it, get into action, and change something. And that's the fourth level of awareness. It's your smallest market but it's also the market that's most apt to buy, right? They're ready to, you know, to, to do something and move forward um, and awesome. fix the problem. Yeah, that's really, I've never heard that before, but that really makes total sense what you just said. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's, it's one of the ways that, uh, you know, awareness of a problem is really, really important for marketing, but you know, in terms of just like living life, knowing your stage of awareness for something like fear, um, right. So you have to first be aware that you have the fear yeah. and, you know, why do you have the fear and how do you overcome the fear? And then you actually right. have to get into action and do things. Right. So it, it's, it's a method of moving, overcoming those things as well. I totally agree with you. I think that's, that's brilliant actually. Awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, so my next question for you is uh, your common enemy and your common enemy for, you know, in the superhero realm is the thing you fight against. 
Right. And so I like to think of this, frame this in terms of your clients in your business, right? The people that you actually work with. If you could wave your magic wand and remove a mindset or remove something that you continually run into with people you work with that's stopping them or keeping them from getting results you know they could get, yeah. right? That you just run into over again, over and over and over again, like you're beating a head against the wall. What is that thing that you have to fight against all the time? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I think is very pervasive in this, in our society, it's negative thinking. Um, it's, it's really, and, and it's also a function or negative thinking is a manifestation of what I talked about before, fear, doubt, confusion, indecision, and worry, right? And, um, you know, Bob yeah. Parker's got a saying about worry. He said, you know, worry doesn't rob tomorrow of its sorrow. It robs today of its joy, right? So worrying about something that happens tomorrow, <laughs> Good. it's not going to stop it from happening, but it's yeah. going to make today miserable, right? And so, you know, the, the biggest, one of the biggest things that people, and I survey people when they come out of the course, you know, one of the biggest things they get is they, they learn how to deal with and eliminate negative thinking because it's, it, it, it's, you're, it's absolutely possible. However, negative thinking is pervasive. If you don't, I use the example that Napoleon Hill uses. He uses our mind like a garden. You know, if, no matter what the wind blows into a garden, it will grow. If it's got nourishment, it's got light, it's got water. Well, you may or may not know, I'm not a farmer, but my dad was, you know, we, if you don't weed your garden, the weeds will take over. Well, negative thoughts are like the weeds. If you don't weed mm -hmm. your mind, the garden of your mind of negative thoughts, which are like yeah. those figurative weeds, they'll take over. So that's one of the big things that, that when people come into the course, and that's one of the big shifts that they have. I mean, they have many shifts, but the, the one big shift that most people identify is they can now deal with negative thoughts and negative, the negative energy that's, that's running. And by the way, sometimes this talks about making some shifts, as you mentioned in your life. You meet, sometimes you have to trade your friends out. You know, sometimes you have to stop hanging around with family members, um, going to mm -hmm. different places because a lot of negative people out there and you know, misery loves company. And so that's one of the biggest things that, that people walk in, they're full of negativity when they come through the program, they, they know how to deal with that. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's really interesting too for uh, the, the negative thinking because it goes right back into the thing we were talking about a minute ago, which is awareness, right? They're going to come into the program, they may not even be aware that they have weeds growing in the garden. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, and that's one of the first things we do. We, we have people log. We, we actually have them uh, every day do a journal, do a log and say, what are your prevailing thoughts? You know, James Allen, who wrote the book, As a Man Thinketh, back in the late 1800s, said, you know, we, we become what we think about all day long. You know, we, we, mm -hmm. your, your dominating thoughts will eventually manifest in your, in your life. Listen, if you're negative, or if you're getting a lot of negative response from people, you need to think about your own negativity, right? If people are mean to you, it means that somewhere in the world you're being mean to other people. The universe is a perfect mirror. You're never going to hold an apple up to a mirror and see an image of an orange. The universe mm -hmm. is the same way. And so... Your dominating thoughts, whether they're negative uh, and destructive or they're positive and constructive, is what eventually will manifest in your life. And most people aren't even aware of, of that or of what the, the negativity that's going on. So we have people journal that, write out what your dominating thoughts were. You know, where you think, you know, a lot of people go through their life saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not tall enough. I didn't grow up in the right environment. I'm not educated enough. All these things. And that eventually that self-talk eventually will manifest itself in your, in your life. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting how, how powerful journaling is for, for realizing those things. Like, you know, just, I, I mentioned the uh, doctor I started working with. One of the first things he had me do was, you know, journal your food intake for, you know, a couple of weeks, yeah. <laughs> like everything you eat, just write it down. Good, bad, indifferent, doesn't matter. Just write it all down. Right. And as like, first thing that we discovered, I wasn't eating enough. Right. right? <laughs> like you wasn't even aware that was a problem. Um, and you know, it's probably the cause of most of any of the, you know, the downward trend things that he was we were talking about and it's awareness. And so starting with journaling your thoughts or journaling, whatever it is you're, you're working to fix is a great way to, to key in on that awareness and find out what's, what's actually going on. It's very eye opening, you know, and that exercise is probably more for you than it was for the doctor so that you could say, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Jesus you know, no wonder I feel like this because I'm, you know, I'm drinking too much coffee or I'm not eating enough fruit or whatever it is. So it's the yeah. same thing with your thoughts. Yeah. Just write them down and, 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 uh, and keep track of them. And I know it's been a while since I've been in a uh, negative thinking space, but I remember being, you know, younger and doing that kind of thing and writing down. It's like, Hey, what are the things that I'm actually thinking about? And then when you write them all down, it surprises you. You're like, Oh, I'm like, 
<laughs> I'm actually thinking terrible things that I don't have any proof to back up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, and, and listen, negative thoughts for some reason, and again, we don't have time to talk about it now, but there's probably a reason why, because, you know, 10,000 years ago when we were running around on the Serengeti, you had to be in alpha mode all the time because someone was going to attack you or a tiger would get you or whatever, you know, but yeah. you know, that's, the, you know, that's the root of all this doubt and everything else. So, it, you know, being aware of your thoughts and when a negative thought comes into your mind, you know, switching it is, is one of the, the best practices you can ever pick up. Because you're, yeah. you're, you can change your mind in a nanosecond. A billionth of a second is how fast we change our mind. And you can do that. And the key is recognize, oh, and you know, listen, sometimes I do it. I'm walking down the street. Sometimes I'll stop and I'll say, okay, why am I having this negative thought towards this person or this situation? I will literally just stop and, and talk to myself. You know, I, don't, I, you know, I say it under my breath. Okay, I, I'll close my eyes and say, okay, stop being negative. You know, stop being because it doesn't matter who you are. You know, it, it's yeah. stuff happens to everybody, right? I mean, it's the key is recognizing it and 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 being able to switch that light switch in a nanosecond. That's the key. Yeah, one of my uh, um, mentors growing up um, was a, you know his spiritual mentor back in high school, and he used to tell me he he had this metaphor he called the truth train. Um, and the truth train, he's like, is you know the the engine on your train is is the truth. Right. And the caboose on the train is your feelings. Right. And he's like, your, their, your feelings exist. They're real. Like you actually have them, right. but they, they're, they aren't the truth. Right. They, uh, and so you can, you can look at that and, and, um, and you have to think to yourself when something like a negative thought comes up, like I'm not good enough or I don't have whatever it takes or whatever. It's like, that's a feeling you have and it's okay to recognize it, but realize it's the caboose on the train. Right. Absolutely. The truth is, you have a spark of divinity, right? The truth is you have purpose, you have, you know, right. And so, you know, you have to let the, let the truth drive your train, not your caboose. <laughs> I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you, you know, and when you say truth, you know, Bob Proctor is another great saying, and I, you know, I quote him a lot because he was my mentor. He says, you know, don't, he said, don't give me the facts. Give me the truth. He said, the facts are always changing because I want the mm -hmm. truth, you know I mean? And the truth, you know, the, fa it, you know, in your example, the engine is the truth and the caboose, are the facts, you know, they're always changing. Your feelings are always changing. That's not the mm. truth. I mean, give me the truth. I don't want the facts. The facts are always changing. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially if you're, uh, if you're watching the news at all, the facts change all the time. time. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Like on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a different story every day. Yeah. Cause, cause and for in this, for the same reason too, right. It's to manipulate. Right. And that's the, you know, that's what's happening with your negative thoughts is, is they're, they're manipulating your outcomes. Um, and when you start living your life with the truth at the front, then you're not um, being manipulated. You're, you're, uh, you're leading your own life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you I know. tell my kids that all the time. I say, listen, all, I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what political, uh, you know, persuasion you are. I don't really care. I said, just always think for yourself. Just you know, just analyze, think for yourself. That's the key thing. And that's one of the greatest gifts my mom and dad gave us. Just, they'd always say, just think for yourself, you know, just because everybody else is jumping off the bridge. Don't jump off the bridge. Don't be a lemming. Think for yourself, you know, and, and that's probably one of the best lessons my parents have given us. I had, uh, I had, I was listening to a comedian the other day. It just reminded me of a story. He, he said, you know, they, they talk about, you know, would, if everyone else is jumping off the bridge, would you follow them? It's like, it seems like it's a self-fixing problem. If you wait long enough, There'll be a pile of bodies. You can just step off the bridge. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. Cracked me up. So uh, if, you're, if your common enemy is something you fight against, the flip side of that is your driving force. It's the thing you fight for, right? So just like Spider-Man fights to save, uh, you know, New York or Batman fights to save Gotham or Google fights to index and categorize all the world's information. What is it that you fight for in your business? Well, you know, I think it's a very interesting question. You know, I, I think self-awareness is one of, one, of the, one of the things. You know, it's, it's, I, I honestly believe that if everybody understood their, and you, you touched on it, your, your, your own divinity, the, the miracle mm -hmm. of, of who you are, and that we all have a purpose. You know, what's the saying, the two most important days of our lives, right? The day we're born and the reason we, the day we found that, find out why, right? The two yeah. most important days. Well, you know, I mean, that's really my mission. Um, is to create safety and security and comfort and pleasure, not only for myself and my family and my friends, but also my community. And my community grows every day. I mean, you're now part of my community. 
in essence, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think when everybody understands this, this stuff and understands that they're, they're, they are in control of their life, they're not a victim of circumstance, I think the, the world becomes a better place. You know, we stop, we, st you know, we, we, we understand the power of love instead of the love of power, right? And we stop yeah. looking for differences, um, you know, minor differences in, 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 our, in other people. We start to look at the similarities and the, and the commonality and the fact that we live on this, this little precious part of space that's, you know, when you look at it from outer space, it looks like an egg that can crack. And it's the only, it's the only place we have right now. And we start to, you know, we, you know, I honestly believe there'll be a time where, where you know, police forces shrink, um, military shrink, uh, people are sharing, you know, resources. We're not hoarding things like uh, water. Uh, you know, I read an article the other day, you know, the human race would, would cease to exist in less than four minutes. Four minutes if all the oxygen on Earth uh, was, was removed. Four minutes. Wow. So billions <laughs> of years of evolution would be gone in four minutes, right? I hope, I pray that we never get to a point where, um, you know, someone has control of the oxygen, you know, because it's something we all need. And I'm a long-winded answer. My, you know, my driving force is for everybody to be aware of how divine they are and recognize other people's divinity. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, one of the things that um, that I've always loved about the uh, the creation story in in scripture is that, you know, they that God breathed life into um, into man, and um, I always like the uh, the the way our language uses the word creativity um, and um, recreation. Some of those other words they all have um, have roots in divinity, right? Where you have a spark of creativity, spark like that comes from um, comes from your your actual your value. And like when you look at political structures and everything, the reason why our culture in the u.s has been so successful is because it recognizes the value of the individual um and uh it's a um i'm a firm believer that when people know better they do better i totally right? agree. Yeah. yeah and so it's uh you know it sounds like you have you have your your mission of how you're helping people know better you know i've got the same same thing going on the reason we run this show here is to you know, heroes, you know, for, for, for me, it's always really bothered me that uh, culturally um, entrepreneurs are villainized so regularly um, when like literally everything that you've touched in your daily basis has been touched at some point by an entrepreneur. Um, and, you know, so, you know, we're trying to lift those people up, right? And, you know, the more they, they recognize their value in the world, the, I think the better that, uh, you know, the better, better work we do. So, yeah, to your point, you know, when you know better, you do better. Yeah, you help I, the whole world. I could agree with you more. And, and, you know, when you say competition, and I get pushback on this from a lot of people, you know, you cannot have a creative thought and a, and a competitive thought uh, in your mind at the same time. It's just they've proven it scientifically. You can't do it. You're either creating or you're competing. And, you know, real professionals and real successful people, they don't, they don't compete against anybody. They get creative with people. They collaborate with yeah. people. And if they're competing with anybody, it's with themselves simply to be better. And, and yeah, uh, yeah. use the word be better because that's the key you can't you know creativity is is it's that's when you engage your creative imagination you really get in touch with the universal source call it whatever you want call it the infinite intelligence call it god call it whatever you want but there's there's something above and beyond us the, our, we're here for something beyond ourselves and when we realize mm -hmm. that it you, life takes on a whole different dimension you know it happened to me i don't know if you have children but if when my first daughter came along four of them I, there you go. I have three. So my, when my first daughter came along, I realized the world no longer revolves around me. You know what I mean? And, and, and yeah. those, those kids, as you know, as a father, you know, you would do anything for your kids. I mean, you would, I would, I would, if God came down and said, Carl, um, it's either you or the kids, I'd say, make sure they know I love me and, and just make me go. Pain yeah, pain. It'll be me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I yeah. would give up my life. I would give up my life for my kids. And, 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 and so when you really, when you really understand that, it's not about competition. It's about creating with other human beings. The whole world takes on a different dimension. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, that's a unique, unique thing too, to understand the, the realization that you are um, designed for something more than yourself, right? And I, it's, it's interesting how, how important parenthood is um, in that equation. 
because um, it's it's really interesting um, if you look at some of the studies for how people succeed over you know the long term like over hundreds of years like generational wealth and all those kind of things how um, how you you see a marked difference in people's life trajectory after they either a get married and have someone else who's who is uh, um, they're responsible for or b when they have children yeah um, because it's it's like you you realize that you're not living life for you anymore right you're living life for someone else um, I, I totally so. agree when I, when I went to college uh, you know a lot of my buddies got married you know, right when they were in their, you know, the 23, 24 and started having kids. And I didn't, I, I wasn't for, I was 42 before I had my first child. And I look back and I say, no wonder these guys were more, they were more focused. I mean, they were more focused on their career. You know, I was, mm -hmm. out, I was out goofing around and spending money and wasting time and energy and, and chasing something that wasn't, wasn't there. You know, and I totally agree with you. When you look back, the, you know, they had kids, they had a wife, they had accountability, you know, and, and they're, they're, they, you know, they built bigger portfolios. They were earning more money. Yeah. They were saving more money. You know, they were living a more healthy lifestyle. So I totally agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I got four kids and it's definitely like I build my business. I do the things I do um, because of them, because of my wife, because my kids and because like, you know, I'm working with the, the doctor on the health stuff because when I get to be 60, I still want to be as healthy as I am today, right? That kind of thing. So I can be around for them and their grandkids and like that kind of stuff. It, it impacts a lot of your decisions um, to realize that you have other people you're living for that are not just you. Well, good for you. You know, I mean, yeah. and everybody should take on that attitude because you know, we, live in a, we live in an environment where it's very me, 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 me. It's very selfish. You know, look how much I have. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, what's interesting is our birth rates reflect that. Right. Yeah. We have we have the lowest birth rates historically in like the human race yeah. <laughs> right yeah. now that we've ever had because we have a very um, me centric um, culture. Yeah. Uh, and so much so that like Japan and France, both of them have uh, have hired. They call them ministers of sex because they're trying to encourage their their population to actually have babies because they're not having enough babies for their culture to survive long term. Huh. It's interesting. And <laughs> yeah, scary. I, I, I don't know if you knew this or not, but the birth rate in order for a culture to survive has to be at 1.8. Um, and if you drop below 1.8, within 40 years, the culture is gone every oh, single time. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating. If you look up some of the science on it, um, that, that you have to keep a birth rate above 1.8. Um, and Japan and France and a lot of European countries are skirting that line where if they're they're 1.8 1.9 right right in that area where like if they drop below that they like their culture won't won't survive it wow um, I, had, and, I had no idea i'm yeah, at three yeah, the, so i'm good i'm, I'm above the yeah average. you're good <laughs> yeah we have four we're doing it the uh i actually people ask me all the time because once once you get from three children to four children people start asking you like do you know how that works like why are you doing it and my my tongue-in-cheek response is i'm um is is I'm doing my part for uh, for the culture, because <laughs> because you know I think I think think the American culture is worth saving and preserving and, and yeah. moving forward with. Um, and I was like, you know, our our birth rate is like 2.2, um, which is you know significantly lower than it was 100 years ago. Right. Um, yeah, because um, it used to be like three and a half or something. But anyways, that's my tongue in cheek response is, hey, I'm having kids to uh, to help improve our culture. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I want to uh, transition the conversation a little bit and move into the practical realm. Um, so I call this the, uh, the hero's tool belt, right? Maybe you got a big magical hammer like Thor or a bulletproof vest like your neighborhood police officer, or maybe you just really love how Evernote lets you uh, organize your thoughts, right? What for you, what are some of the tools you use on an everyday basis that you couldn't manage your business without today, right? If that's, you know, your marketing or your client retention or actually helping your um, deliver your services, some of the things that you use all the time and that you just you couldn't see your business working without well one of the things is the book itself i, I read from the book i've had the same copy i, I read from it every day and uh, i've memorized quite a bit of it so that's that's the baseline um i'm starting to use zoom more uh as far as technology zoom is a great you know, i think we're on zoom right now you know, yeah we're on zoom great, right now that's a great tool i mean i just got hired to, to train 200 affiliates in the cannabis business of, any, of, of all businesses, but you know, they're from all over the, all over the world. And we get together once a week and we do an hour long training. It's on zoom. You know, you can record it. 
Uh, so the people in South Africa, there's three or four people in South Africa. It's a different time zone. They can watch it at their leisure. Um, you know, it's a great tool. And so that's one of the ones that I've just within the last, I want to say within the last six months, I've really started to use uh, that as a tool. Um, I think it's, it's really, it's a, it's a way to leverage. I used to do uh, in person and the challenges with that was people's schedule and finding the location yeah. that was, that was geographically acceptable for everybody. And, and it, the zoom is such a great tool and you, you know, it's very inexpensive. And it, for a guy like me, that's not a techno guy. It's, it's pretty easy to manage. Yeah. It's amazing too. Like what we can do, right. I've had like, I, I, we manage our podcast interviews from zoom and we've had people on from all over the world and time zones all over the place. And like, we just had someone from London last week. And like, it's, it's amazing to me that you and I can have what is essentially a face to face conversation. Right. Um, and I didn't even ask where you're at. Like, you know, I'm in St. Louis right now and you know, who knows where you are. <laughs> yeah. I'm in, I'm in Chicago. Yeah. So we're, we're across the country. Um, yeah. and we can do things like this, um, so much easier than you could do even four or five years ago. Yeah, I totally agree with you. So that's one of the big ones for me. Um, and it's really had an impact because, you know, now I can leverage my time. I can, uh, I can provide, like you said, I can provide good content. I can have, you know, 200 people on a call at once, you know, and, and uh, it's, 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 it's just a great tool. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really, a really useful tool for, uh, for modern businesses, especially if you're in the mindset or information space, like you and I are. Um, and so it's a, it's really a, a useful tool. Yep. So move on a little bit and talk, I want to talk about your own personal heroes. Um, right. So just like Frodo had Gandalf or Luke had Obi-Wan or Robert Kiyosaki had his rich dad. Who were some of your heroes? Were they real life mentors, speakers or authors, peers who were a couple, just a couple years ahead of you and how important were they to what you've accomplished so far? I have a few guesses from just from how far our, uh, yeah. where our interview has gone so far, but yeah. who are, who are some of your heroes? Well, you know, I, I do look up the Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill was a, uh, he was a, an individual who was born into poverty in, in Virginia. Uh, and really made something of his life. And, and he spent 20 years researching this book. Uh, nobody paid him. He did it on his own dime. Um, almost went bankrupt, uh, you know, destroyed his marriage. Um, so he's clearly somebody I look up to. And then Bob Proctor. I mean, Bob Proctor, for those of you that don't know who he is, he's, he's absolutely phenomenal. He's one of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. And he's made a huge difference in, in, in my life and for other people. So he's certainly one. He's 85 years old. So he's, you know, he's getting up there. Um, he's one I look up to, uh, you know, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Wayne Dyer, um, really love his work. You know, he's very spiritual. God rest his soul. He's passed on, but, uh, um, you know, he's just, he was a phenomenal thinker, um, very spiritual guy, but also, you know, studied a lot of the stuff that I've studied. Um, you know, Victor Frankel, you know, he's an author that wrote the book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, which is, if you've never read that, it's a phenomenal book. Um, I haven't read that one yet, no. Yeah, it's a really, it's a great book, you know, um, read it. I'm not going to tell you the story, but it's a really, it's a really eye-opening book. Um, and so those are some of the people that, um, you know, that come to mind. And, you know, there's other people I've worked with in the past as well. You know, Don Green, as I mentioned, he's the chairman of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Phenomenal guy. We talk probably once a month. Um, you know, I've had a couple of hockey coaches uh, made a big difference. A guy named Bill Morrow. You never know who he is, but when we were kids, he took us to the best team in the nation. Uh, we were 42 and 0. You know, and and uh, uh, he he was believe it or not, he was a mechanic at a at a Chevrolet dealership, and he was just he knew how to motivate us. Uh, he didn't know even know that much about hockey, but he knew how to take a group of 12 and 13 year old kids and mold us. Um, he made a huge difference in our lives. You know, so there's just. You know, Lefty Smith, who was the assistant, or he was the athletic director at Notre Dame, where I used to go to hockey camp. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of people, but, you know, those are the people yeah. that come to mind. And, of course, yeah. my dad. Of course, my mom and my dad. You know, I cannot exclude them. I mean, you know, my just incredible people and incredible parents. It always uh, strikes me whenever I ask that question how varied the responses are from you know, where the influences come from. And it's always, you know, it's, it's teachers and coaches and like normal everyday people who have such a huge impact on your life. And the thing that always strikes me about hearing the answers to those questions is it makes you realize that you probably don't know who you're a hero to, right? 
um, and who is looking up to you and whose life has been changed because of the impact you have on their life, right? And you may never hear the interview where someone asks them and your name comes up. Um, so for me, it's been a uh, it's been an interesting question to um, just think in my own life, like, hey, you should act in such a way that you're worthy of that. If that makes sense. It does make, it, it makes a ton of sense. And, you know, you get to a certain point where you start to realize that, right? And, you know, I mentioned earlier, the old saying, you know, my vessel's full and it's time to overflow and give back because it, you give, you get to a certain point where that's all there is to do. I mean, you can't, you know, it's just, it's, it's just where you're at. And so, um, yeah, you're, you're right. I don't know. And, you know, I don't know what Bill Morrow's doing right now or Bob Proctor's doing right now, but I hope they're feeling good just because I mentioned them because, you know, and, and Bob, no, he, Bob is obviously has some celebrity status. You know, Bill Morrow's just a regular guy, you know, but he made a yeah. huge difference. And every time any of us get together, we, we talk about him, you know what I mean? And, 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 and he had a, a major impact on us. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, priests, <laughs> You know, there's there's a couple of priests that were just really great mentors and and great examples and and uh, you know Monsignor Walsh who's passed on and and Father Ken Kennedy. You know, I mean, just yeah. So absolutely, I mean, I could go on and on, but there's been a lot yeah. of. Yeah, I've uh, I've to to that end, I've made it a point in my life to go back to some of the people that had a huge impact on me growing up and let them know. <laughs> just because for for nothing more than like hey like you had a positive impact on me and I want you to know that um, yeah. because I know that people struggle in their lives as well. And not, you know, they don't always, always get to hear how, how they've positively impacted other people. So yeah, um, that's a thing I've done a couple of times now. Um, that's, a, that's yeah. a great suggestion. So anyway, uh, next question for you is uh, your guiding principles, right? Last, last sort of major question here in the interview top one or two principles or actions that you put into use regularly that you think contribute to the success and influence you enjoy in your business? Maybe something you wish you had known when you started out on this journey of, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. One of them is reflection. Um, you know, I do that, you know, several times a day, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and reflect on, you know, what's occurred or, or what I've said or what I've thought or what I've done. Uh, that's a big one. You know, I, I usually do that at night as a regular practice, you know, reflecting on the day and, and to think about, you know, was this a positive day? Who did I influence? You know, how do I influence them? Um, you know, was I productive? Did I check anything off my, my to-do list? You know, was I, you know, did I say goodnight to my children? You know, did I, did I, you know, tell people I love uh, that I love them? So that's a big one for me. Um, you know, as far as, as, as technical or tactical, um, I'm a big list person. So I make lists um, and then I, I check them off. You know, I have a system for doing that. So that, that is a very, and I actually do it with paper and pen. Um, so My wife does that every morning. She writes a list and checks them all off. Yeah. So it's, you know, a little old school, you know, I, I do use my, my iPhone and my computer, but you know, my, my, my fallback position is always, I've got pads of paper around with headings and checklists. On them. So those are some of the things that I've, that, that have worked for me. So I'm just curious on the, on the list thing, right? Because I know that one of the things that really, really impacts an entrepreneur's ability to succeed is being able to get, to make small progress every day, right? Yeah. To, 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 push, to push the needle forward a little bit, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and one of the, like, the key skills is knowing how to look at all the things you have to do in order to get to some distant goal and break it down into what can I accomplish today to move a little bit forward towards that. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious to know a little bit about your methodology for um, putting your list together at the beginning of the day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, it, not as important to me that it's on pen and paper, but more like the thinking behind yeah. what you choose and how you choose it. Yeah. Well, one of it is the, the law of little things. I mean, you know, it, little things are easier to digest and, and easier to, to deal with, right? We've all call, heard about the elephant, you know, eating the elephant all in one bite. So the law of little mm -hmm. things, breaking things down to their simplest and, and smallest component, right? That makes it easier to manage. That's the first thing. The other thing I always look at tasks from three perspectives. Is it something that I can eliminate? Is it something I can delegate? Or is it something that I, I, I want, it's required for me to prioritize, right? So if I look at something on my list of things and say, I don't really, this really isn't required. So let's just get rid of it. If it's something that's required, but 
I'm not required to do it. In other words, somebody else can do it more efficiently or more effectively, I'll, I'll designate it. Or if it's something that I absolutely have to do, like for example, this interview, uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, then I'll set a priority to it, right? And so um, the other thing that I do is I limit my list to six things in a day. And I got this right out of from Bob Proctor because he used to say, make a list of things you do. I'd come with a list of 30 things. He'd say, well, how in the hell are you going to, pardon my French, but how in the heck are you going to manage that? He said, break it down to six things, right? So I just write out six things every day. And those six things, you know, half the time I find by noon, I'm done with it. So I make another list of six things, right? But it's not overwhelming, right? So it's, it's yeah. manageable. And so that's one of the, you know, with my list. And those six things that go on a list are usually things that are, they're little things that will move the needle forward and that are in a, a prioritized um, uh, fashion. In other words, they're prioritized as far as the first thing. And, you know, Stephen Covey wrote a great book about, you know, habits of successful people, right? He said, you know, first things first, do the first thing first, right? And mm -hmm. break it down to the smallest component and just get it done, right? And so, um, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the methodology. I hope that answers the question, but that's part of my Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I've, I've got the same kind of thing. I didn't realize Bob Proctor was the one who did the whole six things because I do the same thing where I, I, I try to get, you know, six things on the list. Yeah. Um, and in terms of priority, um, my, uh, my same spiritual mentor, one of the things he used to tell me all the time was, uh, was hard things first, yeah. right? So if you do all the hard things first, then everything else is easy. Yeah. Um, so that's always how I've, how I've um, worked the priority on the things. It's like, what is, what's the hardest thing on the list to get done? The thing that, you know, makes me like, feel ill to want to do it yeah. <laughs> right? yeah and like let's just do that get it out of the way and get it done yeah. um and that's uh that's really helpful and like i I'm, I'm curious can you repeat the thing about the the three types of tasks you want to yeah, eliminate yeah. it because um, yeah, yeah. so, like I'm, I'm not doing that and it seems like that would be a, a really useful thing to start oh, yeah. sort of like yeah. taking yeah. off yeah absolutely so when you when you look at something when you write something down and you say is this something I can eliminate? In other words, is, is this, it's either moving you towards your goal or it's moving you away from your goal. So if it's not moving you mm -hmm. towards your goal, eliminate it. If it's something that's gonna move you towards your goal, but you don't have to, you, so you can offload it or delegate it to somebody that can do it more effectively or more efficiently or less expensive valuing your time, delegate it to them. Find the person to do mm -hmm. it, right? Like it could be washing your dishes or you're doing your clothes or you know, some people hire people to fill their car up with gas and wash it that's a waste of their time right so if it's something that you, you know if you want your car clean but it's something somebody else can do for you delegate it right and if it's something that absolutely only you can do like this interview then you prioritize it right you prioritize that based on is it that like you said the either the you know first things first or do the hard thing right so it's either eliminate delegate or prioritize that's that's the, the yeah method. yeah so um i always uh i always the thing that I'm striving for in my business, I'm not there yet, um, but is to only do what only you can do, yeah. all right, to the, your point of what, like, what are the things that, that require you, right, require your perspective, require your unique skill set, require um, you and your business, right, so I've been, I've been building my team over this last year, and the, the, the work that I've been trying to do is trying to get out of the delivery of services and into the CEO mode, Right. right. And doing the things that the CEO needs to do, which is like figuring out the systems and figuring out the vision and the plan and the path forward and working on delegating or eliminating the rest. Um, so I like, I like that, uh, that sort of mental framework of like, let's look at our things, eliminate what's not needed, um, delegate the stuff that needs to be delegated and, uh, um, and prioritize the things that only you can do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I don't, you know, take this for what it's worth, but you're, you're, you're actually doing it. You know, you said several times you're trying to do it, but you're not trying because there is no trying. You are, you're doing it. I mean, you're, you're building your business. Every day you're, you're checking your stuff off and you're starting to act more and more like a CEO, which by the way, you know, I've, I've done a lot of business consulting as well. You know, CEO's primary job is adding value and building value for sh stakeholders and shareholders. So mm -hmm. you're not trying to do it. You're actually doing it. And that's a, that's a, I mean, you should, you should uh, acknowledge yourself. And, and by the way, that I also do that. When I, when I have an accomplishment, I do a little celebration, you know, it may be a private little thing. It could be as quickly as just saying, you know what, that was good, man. You got it. You did a good job or you, it was a good phone call or you made a difference because I think we don't do enough of that either. I don't think we, we yeah. acknowledge ourselves for, you know, um, for, for being and doing, you know, the things that we commit to because that's gratifying. 
Yeah, we do. Uh, I try to make that a regular part of our of, our, of of my life. I don't always succeed at doing it all the time, but I like uh, you, you mentioned. You know, you check off the six things, and when you're done, you'll uh, you'll write another six things down. My rule of thumb is if I check off all the six things, I'm done for the day. I, I go play with my kids, <laughs> yeah. um, and like if I do them an hour or six hours, like I get that I get those things done, and then I go play. Yeah. Um, and, uh, because, you know, I figure I'm only young once my kids are only young once. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so I check off whatever we need to do to move forward. And it's, it's interesting. Cause if I go back five years ago, I was in a place where I was like, you know, I had to work from morning till night and like, I wasn't doing anything in my life except work and sort of realizing that like, that doesn't, it doesn't work to live your life that way. Um, so it's like, if, if you are prioritizing your stuff well, and you're moving everything forward just a little bit every day, um, it, it doesn't take 18 hours a day of work to build a successful business. No, right? It no. takes a little bit of progress every day. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> um, that's been a huge win for me is learning how to celebrate by I finished what I need to do today. Let's go. And for me, my rewards is those four kids that are up there that want my attention. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and what a better reward, right? Yeah. I mean, and so. it, it's, they've done studies, you know, that say, you know, after four hours, there's a diminishing return. You know what I mean? It's, I tell my yeah. daughter, she, you know, she's very hard on herself. I said, honey, I said, after four hours of homework, you're not getting, you, you might as well just stop doing the homework because you're, you're, it's a diminishing return. You know, you're not getting the same. Yeah. You're not getting anything good going. Right. So that basically wraps up the interview. I do have one thing that I do at the end of every interview. I call the hero show or the hero challenge. And the hero challenge is simple. Um, it's basically this. Do you have someone in your life or in your network that you think has a cool entrepreneurial story? Who are they? First names are fine. Um, and why do you think they should come share their story with our audience here on the hero show? Well, there's a guy actually in your backyard uh, who used to live in Chicago. He's from St. Louis. He's a very good friend of mine. His name is Sean. I don't mind sharing his last name. His name is Sean Brady. And Sean is a, uh, uh, he and I have traveled the same path uh, in some regards, some of our training. And uh, he's just a super guy. I mean, he's got a, he's got a wonderful family and, uh, you know, uh, uh, three, how many kids does he have now? Three or four kids. Um, and, um, you know, he's an entrepreneur. I mean, he's a real estate guy. He thinks big. Uh, you know, when he told me 10 years ago, he wants to own an NFL football team. I looked at him and said, that's awesome. I said, that's, I, I can't wait for you to do that because I want to be yeah. there at the Super Bowl. I want to be in the owner's box. You know, and he laughed. He said, you know, you're the only person who said that. He said, everybody else I tell that says you're out of your mind. I said, well, oh no, that's their problem. You could totally do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, and he thinks big. Um, he always doesn't, doesn't always make the mark. But he never, he's persistent, you know, and he's, and that's one of the principles of thinking we're rich. He's also a big thinking we're rich, a fan, and he's done my course. He did my course years and years ago, but yeah, Sean Brady's a great guy. He's very well connected in, in St. Louis um, and offline. If you want me to connect him with you, I'd be more than happy. Yeah, to. He's absolutely. We'll, yeah. We'll reach out afterwards, see if we can uh, connect with him. So Last part of the show. First off, thank you so much for coming on, Gordon. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Where can people find you if they want to go through your course on either Think and Grow Rich or finding their focus and go through that training? And then more importantly, who are the type of people that should reach out for that, those, those programs? Yeah, so uh, I have a website. It's uh, www.yourfocusguide.com. And that's got all kinds of information about me and my programs. Um, if you want more specific information, uh, just email info at yourfocusguy.com. So it's info at yourfocusguy.com. Um, you know, people I'm, I'm looking for, um, you know, affiliate marketers, people that are in the affiliate marketing business, um, all these principles absolutely apply to them. Um, so the, I'm working with some of the top uh, ranked people with regard to uh, network marketing and affiliate marketing. And then just anybody, you know, most of the people I work with are between the ages of, uh, you know, 25 and about 45. Um, the youngest person that I ever trained was about 17. The oldest person was 92. Um, everybody can use more focus for sure. But I mean, really the, 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 the core are people that are, you know, young professionals and people that are, you know, in that, you know, they're transitioning, they're in that mid forties range, but uh, it's really, and it, you know, it's for men and, and women. Um, and, and, you know, I, that, that's pretty much the, that's who they are. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for being on the show, Gordon. Really appreciate it. If you're listening to this and you find yourself struggling with focus, reach out to Gordon. It's uh, yourfocusguy.com and, and check out his programs. It should be a 
really useful for you. Gordon, do you have any final words of wisdom before we hit the stop record button on this episode? No, I, you know, other than thank you very much. You, you'll keep up the good work, right? You know, you're, 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 you're doing it. And, you know, in the words of Napoleon Hill, you know, one of his most famous concepts or, or statements was, you know, anything the human mind can uh, believe and, uh, or I'm sorry, conceive and believe you can achieve. So, you know, really the limits are, are all self-imposed. So just, uh, you know, think outside the box and just keep moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you again for coming on the show, Gordon. Really appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Thanks.